right, continuing with this series on revisiting uh, old Baptist hobby horses. And one thing, uh, I, last week I was going to include both smoking and drinking together, and I figured I, I, it was just too much to say, particularly on drinking from the Bible, and so I divided them up into two lessons. So tonight, the message is, and I worded it this way on purpose, but drinking intoxicating beverages. All right, drinking intoxicating beverages is the idea. You say, what do you mean, old uh, preacher's hobby horse? Well, depending on how many years back you go, there was a time when this was the main thing that was preached from almost every Baptist pulpit, and, uh, and so this was the case. I was saved when I was about eight years old, and from that point on, I always went to independent fundamental Baptist uh, churches. My dad was in the military, so we moved a lot, but we always found a good church to go to. And for many years after I was saved, I assumed that every Christian just taught that drinking alcohol was bad. Don't drink alcohol. And partly was because when my dad got saved, short, shortly after, probably the same year that I got saved, my dad got saved, and I, what I remember as a kid is that he was a drinker, pretty heavy drinker. I don't remember him being like abusive or anything like you talk about, like some pa parents, I mean, some uh, kids talk about their parents that drink or whatever. They're abusive. I don't remember my dad doing that. I do remember him seeing him drunk. I do remember him drinking a lot. Uh, but he, uh, once he got saved, he decided, you know what, Christians don't drink, and so I need to stop drinking. This was the way I interpreted it as a little kid, and he poured all his alcohol down the drain. He didn't want to just like give it to somebody else or you know anything like that, and so he dumped it all out and threw it all away. And in my mind, from that day forward, it was just like all Christians for for many years anyway. All Christians think drinking alcohol is bad. All right. So uh, as I continued uh, to grow up, I mean, you know, somebody would say something about drinking. Maybe we'd go to a restaurant and somebody would say, "Hey, would you like to look at the wine menu?" And my family always said, "No, no, no, we don't drink. We're Christians." Now, you guys already probably know that does the, you know, what world are you living in? Lots of Christians drink, right? But this is the way I grew up, thinking, hey, we don't drink because we're Christian, all right? And I thought that this is what every Christian believed. Uh, I heard stories about Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday wasn't a Baptist. I'm pretty sure he was Presbyterian, if I remember right. And, uh, and a lot of the guys that spearheaded some of the things in his day were actually reform reformers, you know, and and uh, but at that time they were uh, teaching really heavily on what's called the temperance movement. Okay, the temperance movement was teaching on uh, abstaining from alcohol. Right, that's where we get the word uh, teetotaler. Teetotaler. You know, when I was a kid, I always thought when someone said, "Are you a teetotaler?" Well, I say, "Kid." Uh, I was I didn't hear that word till I was in my teens. Are you a teetotaler? And I thought they meant you drink tea instead of alcohol. <laughs> That's what tea, you know, you're a teetotaler. I didn't even know what total, what they meant by total, but a teetotaler. No, after I re researched that a little bit, it's it's real simple. Uh, you you're, you believe in total abstination, abstinence when it comes to drinking. I, I don't drink at all. And that's what they mean. In the tea, there's different theories on why they came with the tea totaler. Uh, but but some people say it was just T, like saying like with a capital T, you know, emphasis on the uh, on the the fact that I'm a totaler, I'm a T totaler, you know what I mean? And some uh, there's different theories. One person said the guy that coined that phrase, uh, you know, was a, he stuttered, and so he said t -t 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 totaler. <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't. Know. You, you know how legends get get told. But it, this all came from the uh, temperance movement in the late 1800s. In the early 1900s, uh, so I mean, you know, think about that time period. You know, when is the what, when is the typical period we think about the Wild West? Isn't that the 1800s, like the mid mid 1800s, kind of getting out of getting out of it? Uh, anyway, so you think about that time. There was a group in 1873 known as the Anti Saloon League, and this was part of the temperance movement. Hey, we need to get these saloons shut down, and then. Uh, uh, in uh, 19, let's see, 1906, no, that one was in 1906, the Christian Women's Temperance Union was in the 1800s, Christian, Temp Christian Women Temperance, and so the idea was, if you study, study that, 
these women were saying, hey, we're tired of our men getting drunk and doing this and that and losing all their money gambling and beating on the, uh, their wives and all this stuff. And so they started like saying, we need to get these saloons shut down. We need to get people to stop drinking. And so uh, ultimately that and the rise of many hard preachers and probably one of the most notorious, like I said, was Billy Sunday, uh, you know, led to what's known as the Prohibition Movement, or the 18th Amendment, where they actually wrote into the law that you could not sell, and I think it, it was a long process, but they said you could not sell or trade or, or whatever uh, alcohol of any kind, I, I guess, for, drink, you know, for just uh, drinking purposes. And so uh, growing up, you know, depending on what you think about this, and this is actually, it recently, uh, uh, Brother Justin and I were talking about the Libertarian Party and what the beliefs are, and then my wife and I the other day had a long discussion on the on a drive in the car, we were going somewhere, and tried to discuss some of these matters on, on was it right or was it wrong to, uh, you know, to put laws and restrictions on that, and then you compare it to other laws and restrictions throughout history, and that's a whole other topic for another day. But really, you start thinking about uh, uh, some of these things, and and you know how did the how how did these certain laws come into place, and these restrictions on different things. And, but there was literally against the law to drink alcohol, I, and people in that generation today, I, I'm sure they can't imagine that even being a, a possibility. And, and sometimes you watch a movie or a show or something from like black and white, you know, from long ago, and they're talking about that, like there's bootleggers bootleggers making alcohol in their basement or something like that. And you're like, why were they doing that? Because it was against the law. And I remember the first time I figured that out, I thought that was kind of that was kind of strange because to me there was drinking everywhere. Everybody was allowed to do it. But the Baptist preachers always preached against it. In fact, I remember people talking about Billy Sunday and glorifying him because he would come and, and see, I, I love baseball, and so he was an ex-baseball player, and so that, uh, as a little kid, thinking, hey, I want to be a preacher, I want to be a baseball player, all these kind of things. Billy Sunday, I thought, man, what a great guy. And the story was told about how he would come up here and he would find a, a bottle of alcohol or something like that uh, at some point in his preaching ministry, maybe before Prohibition, I don't know how he got his uh, the alcohol, <laughs> but he would set it up on the pulpit, and he'd be preaching, and everybody's watching that the whole time, and then he'd have this baseball bat, and he'd crush it while he's preaching really hard against it, and, and everybody would be like, yeah, I mean, that's where some of that, that kind of preaching came from those days, you know, and so there was a lot of preaching against that, and that, that helped to lead to this point where they said, we need to rise up and make, you know, anytime uh, uh, you, you got a group of folks in our society who is really noisy, really loud, really wants things to change, they're the ones that kind of get their way. And actually, you know what that's called is the progressive movement. <laughs> All right? We got to have progress. And that's what this group was actually known of in that time. So today, that would be like the guys who, uh, hey, we got to worry about climate change and we got to do this and we got to put these restrictions on the carbon footprint and we got to, and all these things, this progressive movement, a long time ago, that was actually thought of as the progressive movement that was trying to fight against alcohol because they realized how bad it was for society and we need to reform society and all that. So anyway, that led to, in my mind, hearing all this preaching, thinking prohibition was the great thing, you know, that we needed to get back to or something like that. And I won't get into the problems that caused and everything, but uh, but I remember as a kid, this was just preaching I heard all the time. And it wasn't until I was quite a bit older, I couldn't really tell you how old, but I, I want to say at least uh, upper teens before I actually started being in circles of Christians who were saying, it's okay to drink, you just can't get drunk. But I remember even, even watching the movie or something like that, and there was like a Catholic priest who was drinking, and I remember thinking that was a joke. Like, no, in my mind, even then, I was thinking, like, I was thinking he's, a, he's claiming to be a Christian, but he's drinking. Little did I know, they get, do you know, okay, I was studying on this one time because, uh, anyway, I was studying on this. The, the wine that they serve at communion at a Catholic mass or whatever, the whole thing has to be drunk. They can't, like, you know, put it back in the fridge, you know, because that's, Je that's Jesus' blood to them. That whole thing needs to be drunk. So if they, if after everybody has, you can look it up, man. I'm not making this up. After everybody in the auditorium has drunk their wine, alcoholic wine, right, somebody has to finish up the rest of that alcohol. 
And I've heard stories about people that would, they would drink that and they would get drunk. And oftentimes if they didn't do it, the altar boys <laughs> or, the, uh, or the priests themselves or somebody would drink that. And, get and that's why there's so many stories about these priests that were just absolute drunks because that actually happened a whole lot. A lot of priests became drunks. I don't know how prevalent it is in today's society, but I would assume a lot of priests get drunk because they're okay with it. In fact, they're okay with just social drinking with your buds and sit down in the bar and have a drink and whatever, and you're still a Christian, no big deal. And this was a foreign thinking to me. I had never heard of such a thing. Blew my mind, and then I found out that's true. Then I found out uh, it's not just Catholics, but Reformed people, reform, you know, Reformed theology and all, Presbyterians, uh, uh, Lutherans. I mean, I, I don't know what all groups are against it. I don't guess any of them. And they're fine with sitting down and drinking. They said, oh, it's only wrong to get drunk. It's not wrong to drink. And I'm thinking as a guy, I've never drunk, but I don't know how, how do you know when you cross that line? <laughs> and so I, that blew my mind. I didn't understand. Then I found out there were Baptists, Reformed Baptists, who kind of just jumped on board. Hey, they did it. Why not, why not smoke cigars and drink alcohol like the rest of them? And, uh, and so I remember thinking, oh, how come nobody's preaching on this anymore? And there are still independent fundamental Baptists that preach hard against alcohol. But I remember thinking like, whoa, I, I just thought everybody did. You know, so obviously, when I grow up, your beliefs have to become your own. You can't just go off what, you know, you've been taught all your life. And I had to think through some things. And sure enough, people would point certain things from the Bible to me and say, look, there you go. The Bible doesn't say there's anything. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that it's good to drink or something like that. These are the kind of things that people told me. Here are a few examples. Here's one that I heard a lot. Doesn't the Bible say all things in moderation? You know, the answer to that is no, it doesn't say that. In fact, it got to me like I'm thinking like, whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all thy might. <laughs> you know, whatsoever you do, whether you eat, drink, or do all unto the Lord. And I'm thinking, I wonder how many people claim that and say like, man, I'm going to drink for the Lord with all my might. And I'm gonna just, I, I guarantee you there are people that try to use that in that way. But when it says all things in moderation, that's somebody just made that up. Now, let your moderation be known to all men. Yeah, the idea is being temperate and, and controlling yourself and, uh, and all, but it's not just saying, hey, you can do whatever you want, just do it in moderation. Is it okay to steal in moderation? Is it okay to kill in moderation? Is it okay to do anything else in moderation? No, but you can drink just in moderation, just don't get drunk, right? That argument that's made. Here's another thing that I often say, you've all heard this, but I've, I've had people laugh at me for, for saying that Jesus didn't turn water into alcoholic wine. Laugh at me, ridicule me. Oh, what did he turn into Welch's grape juice? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, he turned it into grape juice. <laughs> Guess what? They used to take grapes and they would step on them and squish them until it became grape juice. They called it wine. Look it up in the Bible. I mean, many times he talks about the grapes of wrath and it's talking about the wine of his wrath. And, 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 and I don't have to, to prove it, really. I think it's common sense. You could even look it up in the dictionary. And wine just means kind of like the liquor of the grape. And liquor is not alcoholic. Liquor just meaning the, the fluid. My, uh, my, my wife's granddad was a missionary in Mexico, El Salvador, and, and uh, that part of the world. And I remember that he would come back sometimes, and there were certain things his wife would always make. And something that he loved was when, he would, when we would eat green beans, he would be, oh, I love that bean liquor. And I remember the first time I heard him say that, I was kind of like, liquor? <laughs> what's he talking about? He was talking about bean liquor. What he's talking about is after you eat the green beans, what's left is the juice. He says, that's the bean liquor. That's the right way to use that word, actually. It's not alcoholic at all. We just know it. We just have, have turned that word into uh, to alcoholic. So, I mean, I wouldn't go around saying I'm drinking liquor, okay? I wouldn't go around saying I'm drinking a glass of wine. I would say grape juice. But historically, it's, it, it just means the juice, all right? Now, is the Bible ever talk about wine where people are getting drunk? Of course it does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some verses on that in a minute. Uh, and, and I'm gonna, I'm probably not gonna labor on these examples right now. I might, might come back to some of them, but here, no, it doesn't say that. Jesus water into wine. Yeah, but it's, I don't believe that's alcoholic wine, and I'll show, and I'll try to explain that here in a little bit. Well, didn't Jesus drink wine? Uh, didn't he drink with the publicans and the sinners? You remember he said, he said, hey, John the Baptist came. 
and he, he didn't eat or drink, and you guys all said he had a devil. And he said, but the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say, uh, you know, he's a wine-bibber and a glutton. And so they say, there, he sat down, he was drinking alcohol, so they said, oh, look, he's a wine-bibber. No, it's just, that's not what he's talking about. John the Baptist was literally eating locusts and honey. <laughs> and they said, there's something wrong with that guy. Jesus was actually sitting down, eating good food, and, and, and uh, 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 not bean liquor, but <laughs> just juice and stuff like that, good drinks and stuff. And they just saw him, and maybe some accused him of drinking alcoholic wine. I don't know. But that doesn't necessarily mean just because they called him, oh, you, drunk, you glutton and wine bibber. Hey, gluttony is, uh, gluttony is uh, let me see, drunkenness is to wine as gluttony is to food. Does that make sense? Okay, so you could get drunk off of, hey, Viviana back there, she gets drunk off of milk all the time. <laughs> she drinks until she's full of milk. She's drunk. Drink, drink, drunk. <laughs> okay, she's drunk. So it doesn't mean necessarily that somebody, you know, is, is drinking wine or they've drunken or anytime you read that in the Bible, you want to kind of read into that and be like, oh, they, they drunk till they were intoxicated. Not necessarily. And there's a lot of arguments that are uh, given about how they couldn't preserve fruit back then and it all fermented and turned to wine. Stuff. Look, I'm not going to get into all that right now. Though that's not my uh, that's not my intention. I just want to make some basic points about why people preach against alcohol, to what extent we should preach about alcohol or intoxicating beverages, I should say, and uh, just kind of visit this idea. It's not the first time, I think it's fair we need to revisit this idea, okay? So uh, look at Deuteronomy 14. Here's another example that people will go to and say, see, there's nothing wrong with drinking. The other one I didn't include here is when Paul told Timothy, drink no longer water, but a little wine for your belly. And some people will take that and say, see, it's okay. Wine's good for your belly. And so you should drink it. Look, uh, there's a lot of, of things that can be read into the scripture there. And the point that I want to make really is that I could take you to, uh, Brother Oster and I were talking about this at the beginning of the ser uh, service when we met here. I think there's like at least 70 probably a whole lot more than that, but at least 70 very clear scriptures about how bad drinking is. Well, yeah, some of them talk about alcohol, I mean, about being drunk, but, uh, and so you could say, no, 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 that's only, that's only drunk. It's not talking about drinking a little wine, but the idea is that drinking any amount of wine, you don't know where that cuts off, and you could become drunken with intoxicating beverage, which we know is wrong. Okay, and so uh, so 70 somewhat clear verses that say avoid it, stay away from it, don't do it, it's unwise, it's bad for you. And then you got about four verses that people go to and say, well, look, that could be saying that it's okay to drink. I'm going to go with the 70, first of all, okay, and say the Bible says don't do it, I'm not going to do it. Okay, but I want to uh, explain this, this one real quickly. Uh, I, I, I'll come back to it here in a moment, but let's read it first. Uh, Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22. So it's talking about when they come to bring their tithe. And look, if you're tithing on your all your increase of your your fruits and vegetables and, and all that kind of stuff, your spices and all, look, you, you've got a whole bunch of stuff that you've got to carry to the, to the temple. And so here is what he said, starting verse 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to uh, place his name there, the tithe of the corn, of, the, of thy wine, of thy oil, and of thy firstly, uh, firstlings of thy herd, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So he says, you know, he tells you right there what the purpose of the tithe was. Why give a tithe, a tenth, tenth of, of your increase? It was that you might fear the Lord, and it's kind of reminding you that he's first. And so they gave their first fruit. Verse 24, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money and bind up the money in thine hand and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, 
for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. And so there they go. They say that he tells you to take that money and turn it into wine. And you say, oh, no, 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 that's not alcoholic wine. They say, well, this is and strong drink, right? Now, I don't see that where it's necessary to go back to the Hebrew and what does that word mean in the Hebrew and all. Look, I think there's a lot of places in the Bible where it says wine. There's a lot of places where it says strong drink. We know sometimes wine is, is not talked about as a bad thing, and sometimes it's talk, it is talked about as a bad thing. And so we have to look at the context, and we've got to find out what it's meaning and all that. And so there's a whole lot that, can say about, that you can say about that. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of speculations. You're probably waiting for me to give an answer uh, to this, okay? So I've heard some people say, well, you know, who knows that that wine and that strong drink was actually for eating or for consuming. Maybe it was for cooking with, like the cooking wine, or the strong drink maybe was just uh, medicine, I've heard people say, or whatever. I don't think it's medicine because it's talking about buying that and then eating it. And so, like, I think it was something else. I've heard some people say, well, it's just a really strong uh, sweet drink, maybe mixed with something else. I have no idea, really. I mean, the strong drink to me, grapefruit juice is strong. <laughs> you ever drink? You ever drink that stuff? You know, how about an energy drink? That's strong, <laughs> right? Anyway, but uh, but it, it, but you know, what is that strong drink? I don't know. The Bible is not specific on that, right? But here's an interesting going back to that conversation that my wife and I had, and that I had with Brother Justin. Uh, I, as you go through the laws in the Bible that God gave to mankind, a lot of times it was left up to interpretation. You know, he didn't necessarily say this was right or this was wrong. He just gave laws that if somebody did these certain things bad, it needs to be judged. All right. Now, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> right? So, for instance, in that theory that what I'm thinking is he didn't necessarily say, hey, don't you have any wine. Don't do this. He, all he did is make a law that said if you get drunk. You know that that's 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 wrong. Okay, if you said, uh, oh, where was my mind going with that? Okay, so uh, so God did that with a lot of things. You know, you could you could look at uh, some cases of fornication and say the same thing. How about uh, polygamy? There are laws in De Deuteronomy that make it sound like, hey, polygamy is no big deal. You can have more than one wife. In today's society, and as Christians, we would, we're appalled at that thought, that anybody would do that. And don't get me wrong, it's wrong to have more than one wife. And every time in the Bible where we see examples of that, there's bad repercussions, and there's bad things that happen, and you're not, we're not supposed to do that. But God, when he made up the laws, and I haven't thought this through. I'm sure I could probably think of some laws where he was very specific and everything. But this, that's the point of the sermon. But what I'm saying is that uh, you know, just because he didn't say, you know, you can only consume beverages, you know, with this percentage of alcohol in it and no more, no less or whatever. <laughs> That's not how he handled things. All right. So the fact that that word is in this description here, it's not like this just license. Hey, just, just go down. You can go to the bar. You can sit down. There's lots of reasons why we wouldn't take that. It's fine. Just, just live like the world and do however you want and drink whatever you want. <clears throat> okay, but I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of speculations, and maybe some are going through your mind about what that strong drink is talking about. It's not the point, okay, of the, of the message. Here's some points that I want to make, and, and, and here's why I shared that verse. Number one is this. What is alcohol? What is alcohol? If you look it up, it's going to say ethanol. The only thing I know about ethanol is that you, it's, it's in gasoline, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, I think ethanol comes from, typically we say it comes from corn. I guess the stuff that is in, your, that, that is in the gas comes from corn or whatever. But ethanol is the, the compound, you know, that is created uh, uh, that we call. It's a chemical, and it's found in many places, okay? Typically, it comes from uh, sugar that's fermented with yeast, right? And this is why, for instance, uh, when a grape gets that kind of white stuff around it. You've all had grapes, and around it has a little bit of white stuff. That's actually a type of natural yeast. And grapes there, that yeast uh, uh, works with that grapes, those grapes. And when those grapes begin to ferment, uh, they're, and, they're, and that yeast is with it and everything, it would, t it would theoretically just turn into wine right there. You wouldn't have to add anything to it. It would just become 
uh, wine whenever it fermented. Theoretically, that's that's what it's producing. Now they've got ways of doing it now where they, you know, uh, change the process and add a little bit more alcoholic content to it and all that kind of stuff. But basically, that is what uh, wine is. And you talk about that fermenting process. I can't help where we'll, we'll read the passage here in a little bit, but where the Bible talks about it moveth itself aright. I don't look on the wine when it's red. It moveth itself aright. And I can't help but think that that's like this, this fermenting process. If you see the process of it, whenever it begins to kind of move, you know, in that, when it's fermenting, it's saying, hey, don't even look. Get yourself into trouble. Okay, now, is alcohol in and of itself sinful? Is alcohol just some kind of thing that exists out in the world? The answer to that I would have to say is no. Alcohol is a lot of different things that we might consume. If you ever drank, uh, what is the name of that? I wrote it down because I always forget. Kombucha? Kombucha? Anybody ever had that drink? Kombucha? I like it. All right. Now, it has some really crazy flavors. <laughs> right? and, then, and sometimes it'll, uh, uh, it's hard to drink a lot of it, that's for sure. But it actually has an alcoholic contact content. And so I have met some Christians that won't touch it because they say it's got alcohol in it, right? But there's no way you could drink enough of that to become intoxicated because your stomach couldn't hold it, right? You couldn't stomach the amount of that that you'd have, but it has a percentage of alcohol in it. In fact, much of our world has uh, in, the much ingredients of food that we eat has a level of alcohol in it. A lot of times you look on the ingredients and it'll say alcohol, uh, uh, sugar, uh, sugar, alcohol, or whatever, uh, it tells you some kind of, there's some kind of alcohol in it. It's not enough to get anybody drunk, but that's just a natural property that exists. And in, in, in fact, vanilla has alcohol. So I looked that, I looked that up. I'm like, well, I don't want to ever get drunk eating vanilla ice cream or something. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not like that. Okay. Now I will say this. While I was researching that, I heard about a place where uh, they had to monitor how much vanilla they sell because people, were, kids were going in and buying like $9 bottle of vanilla and, and, and drinking that so that they could get drunk. And it's like, do you know how disgusting that would be? <laughs> but the alcoholic content was pretty high, I guess, in that concentrated form. But nobody uses that much vanilla. But they were just like drinking this stuff. And so they actually had to monitor the sale of, uh, uh, of vanilla. All right. But most grocery stores, you can go and get it. Not trying to give anybody any ideas, but don't try it, okay? But you understand what I mean. Alcohol exists in the world, and people can take too much alcohol, and it can cause them to be intoxicated. But uh, most of the things that we would say, hey, that's got a little bit of alcoholic content, it's not going to get, there's not even a chance. Nobody would ever take that with a thought of getting drunk, you know? If I eat grapes that are a little bit old, and they started the fermenting process, like I haven't committed some kind of a sin, right? Even if there is some kind of alcoholic content in it, just uh, you understand what I'm saying. Alcohol isn't bad in and of itself, okay? So that could be why, like I said, in Deuteronomy 14, you know, the fact that wine exists, the fact that strong drink exists, however it existed, however they drank it in that form. Uh, I've been told that even the alcohol that the drunkards, like I'm talking about the guys that got intoxicated back then on this wine, even that in those days was not nearly as alcoholic in content as it is today. This is what I've been told because we found out new ways to make it worse. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so anyway, but these did exist. I'm not making a case about whether there was any alcoholic content in that whether Timothy had any alcoholic content in what he was saying, hey, take a little wine for the belly, I'm not trying to debate that. I'm just trying to say uh, that, that alcohol, even though it exists in the world, in, that, in, in and of itself it's not evil, you could say the same thing for cannabis, you could say the same thing for tobacco, you can say the same thing. Look, there's a lot of things in this world that exist that aren't inherently evil in and of themselves. It's the way people use them and what they do with them, okay? And again, we don't really know what the strong drink was uh, that he's talking about there, but that's not really super important. What about this? The effects of alcohol on the humans that consume it. Okay, now this is, again, not talking about kombucha or vanilla <laughs> extract or whatever. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people that go and they buy wine and they buy beer and they buy 
uh, vodka or anything like that from the store and they drink it because they like the entertainment value uh, of it. Here is what I got off of Wikipedia, okay, which is not a Christian site. I don't know who wrote this, but you can look this up on any kind of government site or whatever and get some of the same uh, ideas. Okay, this is just explaining alcohol. It's not even trying to make a case about it being wrong or anything like that. It's just explaining alcohol. It says, alcohol has a variety of short-term and long-term adverse effects. Short-term adverse effects include generalized impairment of neurocognitive function, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and hangover-like symptoms, I never have understood. I, I'm glad, so glad that the Lord protected me. So glad I didn't. Money, what happened to it? They blacked out. Uh, what did I do? I didn't even like being under anesthesia. Dentist or something. I never to be under anesthesia for medical things. But I, they would shoot the needle into my, that's probably why I ain't going to bed I haven't gone for many years. <laughs> they would just shoot that so I can feel that shot, you know. And if that wasn't enough, they would shoot it again uh, and put a shot into my gums. That's it, man. I didn't ever take any kind of, uh, uh, you know, and they'd fill the cavity. They'd get that drill out. I'd be crying. I don't care. I didn't like it, right? But I wouldn't take that, you know, I, I But I was like, no, no, I can't do this thing for a shot. Because I don't like the idea of what am I going to say under the influence of black and gas. Those where somebody under the uh, effects of the drugs are saying all kinds of ridiculous stuff. I'm like, no, I want to be in somewhat control of what comes out of my mouth. I'm already bad enough with controlling it. In as much control as I can with what comes out of my mouth. All right? And I don't understand that. I don't understand wanting to have to throw up and act stupid and get in trouble and probably lose your job or something like that. Uh, it can have a variety of long-term adverse effects on health. For instance, liver damage, brain damage, and its consumption is the fifth leading cause of cancer. The adverse effects of alcohol on health are most important when it is used in excessive quantities or with heavy frequency, which is Often the case with people who end up going down that lifestyle and drinking, they drink more and more and more and more frequently. However, some of them, such as increased risk of certain cancers, may occur even with a light or moderate alcohol consumption. In high amounts, alcohol may cause loss of consciousness or, in severe cases, death. Okay, later on, on the Wikipedia article, it says its use is also related to various so uh, societal problems including driving accidents and fatalities, uh, accidental injury injuries, sexual assaults, domestic ab abuse, and violent crimes. Next time you see a police officer, say, how often are the calls that you get where you have to go to a house, domestic violence or an injury or a car wreck or whatever, how often was alcohol involved? They'll probably tell you most of the time, right? This is just one of the many causes of this. So its effects on humans. Well, we read about it. Let's go back to Proverbs. Solomon was a wise man. And of course, this is inspired by God. That's why it's in the Bible. But Solomon was a wise man and he wrote on many things. He had tried many things in this world and, and he had sought them out and he had thought kind of like with a scientific mind on a lot of things. And what he says right here in this chapter, go down to verse 29, this is Proverbs 23, verse 29, he says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Everybody I know that has had a drinking problem, they've gone through deep depressions. Maybe they've lost family and all this kind of stuff in the process, and so they're just sorrowful. You know, I got a text from, uh, from somebody, I don't know, you might be watching this right now. I got a text from somebody a long time ago, 
and he was just just pouring out his his guts to me on this on this long message and there was a lot of personal stuff and he's having all these problems and the next day he sent me a message and he was like man i'm sorry i was so drunk last night i had too much to drink and i don't know why i texted you all that stuff okay and i remember thinking man just poor guy you know and now he's made those decisions and he'll tell you it's awful it messed my life up okay but he made those decisions and that, therefore, he goes through lots of cases of just depression, just, just secluded and depressed and thinking about all the negatives in this world. Well, the Bible tells you right there, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions. People get in bar fights. They're just real aggressive and fighting because they have no control of what's coming out of their mouth because they're under the intoxication of the, uh, of the alcohol. Who hath wounds without cause? Think about guys wake up in the morning. From with a hangover, and they're like, "What did I? Did I fall down the stairs? What happened? I got a, a, you know, bruises all over me, broken arm, or something like that. What happened to me? Because they were under the influence, and they didn't have any control over what's going on. Who hath red redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, and they that go and seek and, and seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright." At the last, it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. That's another kind of a snake. Let me tell you, look, there are people that like snakes out there. God help them. <laughs> they like snakes. But if you were in a uh, zoo or something like that, and you saw these poisonous snakes, and somebody said, hey, you want to stay away from that, it'll bite you, it could kill you. Wouldn't you be pretty stupid to just get as close to that thing as you can and be poking it and be like that Coyote Peterson? On, you ever saw Coyote Peterson? Uh, he like allows himself to get stung by things and and all over. He's got a YouTube channel anyway, and uh, he and he does a, like a lot of nature type stuff. But he will like mess with these animals, almost like waiting for it to bite him, so that he can kind of show the effects of it, bite uh, of the pain that you go through and all that kind of stuff. And most people watch that and say he's stupid for doing that. Why would you want to keep poking at that snake? Poking it, poking it, poking it. Well, I'm not getting too close. I'm not getting too close. All of a sudden, at the last, it's going to bite. And it's going to sting. And it's going to hurt. It's probably going to kill you and poison you. Okay? Thine eyes shall behold strange women. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. I don't even have to give any commentary on that. Isn't that pretty descriptive? Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. Whereas he that lieth on, a top, on the top upon the top of a mast, you know, I've never been drunk, so I don't know what it's like. But I've watched people drunk, and they're off balance, and they're swaying, and they can't hardly stand up. And it's a terrible sight. It's, it should be an embarrassment. I'm embarrassed whenever I see it. You kind of want to just like cover that person up and go take them, you know, get them off the streets and get them somewhere so that they're not embarrassing themselves and embar embarrassing society, right? <laughs> They have stricken me, shalt thou say, thou have, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Isn't that how a drunk is? You know, they wake up, oh, how terrible, man, I'm depressed, I got a hangover, I'm sick, you know, that was the worst night of my life, I don't have any money left. When's the next party? <laughs> I mean, it just becomes a whole life of this because the stupid substance that people have just given up. Oh, no, 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 just a little bit won't hurt you. Well, that's what every drunk out there, that's how they started. Right. A little bit, of, a little social drinking, no big deal. But don't touch it. Stay away from it. So the Bible has a lot to say about this. Let me just read a couple uh, verses. Uh, also in this chapter, chapter 23 and verse 21, it says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I don't care who tries to convince me. No, 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 there's nothing in the Bible that says it's wrong for me to have a sip of wine before I go to bed at night. Well, I would say... You are playing with a dangerous thing. Even if you can prove that to me, even if your, your own conscience is clear whenever you do it, you're playing a dangerous game because you can so easily get addicted to that and become an alcoholic. I know a guy, I won't mention who it is, who he is, what his name is, or anything like that, but I know a guy that's going through a rough time in his life, 
couldn't sleep at night. And so he said, you know, I started to go get some NyQuil. Maybe that'll help me sleep. And apparently NyQuil has a little bit of alcohol in it. So he said, and he was a preacher, by the way. And he said, you know what? If I'm going to get NyQuil and it has alcohol in it, I might as well get a bottle of wine. It's cheaper. It tastes better. And I'll just drink a tiny little bit of it. It'll help me sleep at night. And so that sounded like a reasonable thing for him. So he did that. And guess what? After many years of being a pastor, many years of giving that stuff up, uh, he did this and ended up falling right back into drinking, right? Because he said, well, you know what? Instead of just NyQuil, I'll just go with, with alcohol um, and with, with actually purchasing wine or whatever. Now, you see how you can make the argument, right? Like, why is that any different than, you know, the other things that you can get in this life that are natural, but they could, uh, they could cause them? You know, or, or, or the argument, here, here's an argument, I make myself a lot of times. Well, what the doctors prescribe to people, you know, or what they give you uh, before, uh, uh, like what's something they give you um, uh, whenever they're putting you in for a surgery or something, circling in. Morphine. morphine. You know, they give me morphine before a surgery. You know, like how is that any different? That's worse than alcohol. Well, I, I granted, you wouldn't go around just drinking morphine, <laughs> right, And as a social drink, okay? I'll grant you that. But people will say, like, oh, not any worse than that. Yeah, but, but typically people don't become uh, ad addicted to morphine unless it's a continual use, and then they just keep going back to the doctor and saying, hey, prescribe me some more or something like that. But look, it's the same thing. person gets a little taste for the alcohol, alcoholic beverages, intoxicating beverages. They say, wow, I like that, and they begin taking it more and more. Now, I don't think vanilla ex ex extract is going to do that to you. I don't think that... Uh, uh, kombucha is going to do that to you. I don't think even NyQuil is going to do that to you unless you've got a real serious problem. But, uh, but, but who, I mean, don't, who wants to just go down that road uh, that might lead to being a drunkard, okay? So what is actually sinful about it? Well, I mean, anything that can turn people into something that's very ungodly and, and very wicked, like why would you want to even go that route? I would think it is a sin if for no other reason just because the foolishness of, of allowing yourself to go down that road and be tempted by that. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And I can take you to many verses in the Bible where it's saying, hey, you're supposed to be sober. You're supposed to be of a sound mind. You're not supposed to be under the influence of alcohol. And again, I know people are going to make the argument and say, okay, well, there, you know, it is possible to drink alcohol and not be like that. Yeah, but if the goal is to be of a sober mind, why put things into you that are going to possibly make you unsober, <laughs> make you drunk, intoxicated? Okay, so it's a very unwise thing. I, I do believe it's sinful to go down that road. Now, obviously, it's, there's, there's, you know, you're trying to measure sins, which sin's worse than another one. Look, I preached on, on the smoking last week, and, I, and, and look, now smoking, I preached on why it was wrong. And it does affect other people and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you know what? I don't believe that smoking is in the same ga category of somebody who is actually a drunk. All right? The Bible actually says in 1 Corinthians 5 that a drunkard needs to be put out from the assembly. So if somebody in the assembly, somebody in our church was a drunk, and especially if they walked in and you could tell they were intoxicated, look, the Bible says, hey, don't just entertain that person. That person, you don't know what they're going to do. Uh, you, they're not of a sound mind and all that and, and, and that and they're setting a bad example for everybody in here the kids are seeing them and all that kind of stuff but there is a time to say hey, that person is intentionally allowing himself to be in this condition it's not like Noah where he got drunk uh, I don't know the whole story I guess he could have done it on purpose but he got drunk and he's naked and his, and his, his, his good kids pick a sheet and, and cover him up and try to hide him and he wakes up and he's like ashamed of himself, right? Something like that could happen on accident. I've heard of people going to somewhere and drinking uh, a punch or something like that. Didn't realize that somebody had spiked it and put alcohol in there and they end up getting drunk. Look, I didn't do that on purpose, you know what I mean? But a person who deliberately does that, there's something wrong. That person has to get that right before they're just welcome to participate in, uh, in regular you know, functions of the church. Okay, so, uh, so that's uh, Ephesians 5, 8. Look at 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, these are the qualifications of a pastor. 
And of course, the reason a pastor is supposed to be held to these standards is because this is, he's supposed to be setting an example of how everybody else should be. Should be. Okay, and so, uh, so you can read the qualifications of a pastor and you can see a lot about what, uh, what we all should strive to be. This is 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 3 says, uh, this is talking about the qualifications of a bishop, must not be given to wine. Okay, and then under, under deacons in chapter 3, verse 8, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. You can say, okay, he says not given to wine, not given to much wine. And I've heard people make arguments about that and say, hey, look, a, a deacon can have a little bit, but he just can't give, be given to much. And, and the pastor, you know, he, can, he just can't be given to it, like addicted to it. He can't have a problem with it. And this is the way people try to do that. But I think uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, this should not be something that he, he engages in. Now, the argument can be made. Hey, well, what if a preacher takes NyQuil? I mean, is he disqualified from the ministry? <laughs> you know, what if he has some small uh, content of alcohol in his system? Should that disqualify him? You know, what if he, uh, he had uh, some, some stomach problems, you know, and he, and he read that part about T Timothy, take a little wine for your belly, and so he did it. Like, does that automatically just make this a wicked guy and we need to remove him? No, I, don't, I think the case could be made that, that, that those aren't, those aren't wicked things, but we're talking about somebody, look, even if they're going and they're drinking alcohol in public where people can see them and they're out and they're, and they're saying, oh, yeah, hey, just, you know, come on, we'll just sit down and have a drink together. I mean, Jesus did it, but that guy's not qualified to be a pastor. I mean, he shouldn't be doing that, setting up a bad example for everybody and uh, possibly leading them down a bad road. Alcohol is a tool that's used by wicked people to take away your senses and to abuse you. Look at Habakkuk, chapter 2. I hate even reading this one. But it's in the Bible, and we're talking about this subject. i got to go through my uh, Nahum, Habakkuk. Okay, there we go. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 15. Again, whoa! Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to, uh, I'm sorry, putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with the shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered, and the cup of the Lord's uh, right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. You notice right there what he's saying is that he's giving this drink to his neighbor and he gets his neighbor drunk and he looks on his nakedness and that's just sick and wicked and why would he want to do that? But I'm telling you what, wicked people out there will use that as a tool. And, uh, and I can't imagine like these, these priests or even, uh, you know, reform guys or whatever that say, no, 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 man, we're going to sit down and enjoy a beer or whatever and, and, uh, and you know, who knows what they get into. <clears throat> And look at them, some of them look a little fruity. <laughs> okay. And who knows how they're going to get into this and how that wine is going to lead them to do some disgusting things. And, 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 you know, why would we want to be engaged in anything that could even possibly lead to that kind of wickedness? The last point I want to make, I'll try to be real quick here, is Jesus, would Jesus have encouraged drunkenness? And we won't go to John chapter 2, but when he turns that water into wine, the argument's always made. Yeah, yeah, see, the people were sitting around, and they drank all the wine until they were drunk, right? Because in the context, if you're reading it, you could make it say that. You could look at that and say, hey, see, they drank it, and they were drunk. And then Jesus brings out the good wine is what they said. And he had actually, they ran out of wine, and so his mom said, hey, what are we going to do? They ran out of wine. And so he tells us, it's a picture, okay? There's a great uh, illustration being taught here. And he says, all right, take that water from those pots right there and uh, pour them into these other pots. And then that water becomes fresh, new wine. And so the way people interpret that is, that, is like, hey, man, we've been drinking all night. And, and we run out. Of, and most people, like, they bring out the bad stuff at the end of the night. You, you bring out the good stuff, like the good stuff, man. You know, like that's the stuff that really gets you going. You really think Jesus is looking at people that had too much to drink? And just saying, you know what? Here, have some more. Does that sound like something that Jesus would do? 
No, he's bringing them good juice, <laughs> good beverage, a good fruit. Just this is a party. They want to enjoy themselves, so they have a good tasting beverage, but not alcoholic. And I don't believe Jesus turned water into alcoholic wine. Man. He said, well, what about the Lord's Supper? Man, they're supposed to have wine whenever you serve the Lord's Supper. Well, yeah, the Bible uses the word wine. He says, take this and drink. And he's talking about, he said, this represents my blood. But, you know, I think a really strong argument that shows that that wasn't alcoholic wine is the fact, and I'm sure everyone in here have heard the argument, is the fact that he, right before that, gives them bread, and that bread is unleavened, which means it has no yeast in it. Why? Because his, he, it represents his body, and his body was perfect, his body was pure, it had no sin in it, and so therefore the bread was supposed to be unleavened. Okay? So why would he all of a sudden say, oh, with the wine, <laughs> we're going to have lots of leaven in it, and it's going to get people drunk and all that kind of stuff. You're talking about Jesus, the same Jesus that said, hey, you heard it said not to kill, but I say to you, if you're, if you're even angry with your brother, you commit a sin in your heart. You heard it said not to commit an adultery, but I say unto you, even if you look at a woman and lust after her, you commit a sin in your heart. You've heard it said not get drunk, but you know what? You can drink a little bit. <laughs> I don't believe that Jesus would say that. I think it's a it's it's weird for people to make that kind of argument. Look at uh uh well I'll just read Luke chapter 17, verse 1. <laughs> Jesus said this, he said, then, uh, then said he to, to his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. I don't think Jesus would encourage people to drink for the simple fact that people that drink often are the ones who cause the offenses. They get drunk. They might invite somebody else to a party. Hey, this is the first time this person ever tasted this stuff. Now this person has an appetite, and this person ends up getting becoming a drunk, all because of this guy, right, who, who didn't have discretion to say, look, I'm not even going to look at that stuff when it moves itself right. He, he who's deceived, you know, he's who's deceived, he's not wise if he's deceived by, uh, by strong drink. And I believe that that is a very strong uh, case to be made, just looking at the life of Jesus, how he lived, why would he have encouraged anybody to do something that could lead to him getting drunk? Again, the arguments are going to be made. And not by anybody in this group, I'm sure. But arguments will be made. Well, you know, but you know where does the Bible say that's a little bit? And you even said kombucha and vanilla and all that stuff. And all that. We're talking about two different things, man. In the society that we live today, like even if you could make the case, and I think it could be made very strongly, uh, that in the uh, Bible days, that would have been used as a medicine, right? Just like NyQuil has alcohol content in it. Uh, they would have used that, you know, you couldn't really just give somebody a painkiller. They weren't just like prevalent back then that I know of, right? So if somebody is, uh, is, is in severe pain, somebody's dying, somebody's, uh, you know, going through some severe cases, well, yeah, they might have given them those as a, as a way to calm them in a way kind of like medicinally to take care of them, that's a totally different thing. But nowadays in our society, you wouldn't have to do that. You know, there's no reason, in my opinion, for a Christian to ever have to go to a liquor store. No. Well, you don't know, I'm just getting it for a minute. Well, then go get a prescription you know, from the doctor or go get you a little medicine or go get you something like that. And look, a lot of those, I don't care if it's over the counter or prescribed by a doctor, a lot of that stuff's garbage too. You need to stay away from it. But, uh, but I'm saying that that's totally different than going to the liquor store and buying something and saying, hey, I, I think this will help me. You're lying to yourself. You're being deceived. And you're not wise if you do that because it is going to cause all kinds of problems. Look, the world even knows that. I read uh, Wikipedia's, uh, uh, what they had to say about alcohol, and they actually provided this chart. Now, there's a lot of variables. Anytime you do a chart like this, this is why it's hard to believe statistics whenever you read them. A lot of variables here, but of all the, the uh, substances and drugs, if you will, in our society, and you, you can just list them. I mean, you can think of lots of them. Uh, uh, I'm, not super, I'm not super familiar with a lot of them, so uh, I can't think off the top of my head, but meth and, and LSD and all these kind of stuff. Uh, the chart even had mushrooms. Like there's mushrooms people could take. I'm not talking about the kind like on your pizza or you get from the store, but... Uh, there are certain mushrooms that people will take that they take as a hallucinogenic and they actually take it like a drug to give them a, some kind of a weird buzz or something. Okay, and mushrooms, there are mushrooms out there that will kill you, by the way. 
So don't go picking mushrooms off the ground and trying to eat them. But the uh, uh, but this chart just laid all of these out, and the way that it ranked it was how dangerous they are by statistics. You know how how deadly they are, how harmful they are, I should say. Uh, and it had it gave two categories: how harmful they are to the person that's consuming it, and how harmful it is to other people. Right. So the idea would be, for instance, if I got drunk, uh, more likely to cause an accident and harm somebody else because of my drug. And it takes all that into consideration. I don't know, there's, like I said, there are a lot of variables in this. But in the list, uh, uh, let me give you an example. So alcohol is way off the charts. Out of a scale of like one to 100, it's like 70. Okay, everything else is more like 25 or something like that. I don't remember the exact, uh, the, the exact uh, list. You know, uh, uh, marijuana, for instance, not really that high on the, on the charts, you know. LSD is like way towards the bottom. Now, here's one of the variables of the chart is that not that many people are doing that. Lots of people are drinking. And so if that's what they took into consideration, then obviously drinking is going to be more harmful. But my point is that in our society today, people are killing themselves with alcohol. They're killing other people with alcohol and the amount of wrecks and, and, and the amount of violence, domestic abuse and all that kind of stuff. Alcohol is destroying our nation. Now, look, I'm not going to go call for another prohibition. I'm not going to go out there and pick at all the liquor stores and do all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm not going to get an alcohol up here and hit it with a baseball bat and try to make some kind of huge statement about that our society needs to get. But I'll tell you what, it is wicked. It is wicked. And we need to stay away from it. Uh, I believe Baptist churches need to continue to preach about the harmful nature of it and say, hey, stay away from those things. Keep your mind sober. Keep your heart on the Lord. Keep yourself a, a, a harmless, you know, you're not harming other people by the things that you're doing. You're not offending other people. And one thing that is obviously a strong way to minimize that is just don't ever touch or look at alcohol. And the Bible is so clear on that and so many verses on that that, shares, uh, that show us that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you that you kept me from... Uh, getting involved in alcoholism and, and I know it doesn't make me any better of a person than anybody else uh, we've all got different different background stories and different things that we've dealt with and different sins in our lives that we've dealt with but Lord when I think about just the harmful nature of alcohol what it does to people and what it does to lives and families and, uh, and what it has done to our society what it's cost our society and just uh, uh, dumb people down, cause cancer, brain damage, all these kinds of things. Lord, I, I really feel sad uh, for our society. And, uh, and the actions you're going to judge, I know that. It doesn't matter what the reason is, but the actions and the sins that are going on as a result of it are wicked. And they need to be judged. You will judge them. But Father, I, I sincerely would love to see... Uh, more people in our society convinced that alcohol is wrong and that they would make decisions to stop drinking. Uh, and I believe that that would help our society, uh, Lord, and it would give us clarity of mind and, and uh, um, people would be able to receive your word better if that were the case. And, and Lord, so I pray that you help us to keep this topic uh, strong in our hearts and we'd be very uh, uh, mindful. Uh, Lord, we don't know how bad the addiction is and how it takes control of a person, how hard it is for them to quit. Uh, but Lord, I do pray that you'll help us to to realize the dangers and try to help people to get out of it and uh, and that you would bless as we try to do that. Keep us protected. Keep our young ones in here protected and teenagers protected from ever going down that road, never trying uh, that kind of stuff, thinking that it would be cool. And Lord, we know how unwise that would be and how it could cause a, a whole lot of harm in the future. So I pray, Lord, that you give us desire to do right and to stay, keep our bodies in check and keep our sober mind. We want you to be glorified in all that we do. Pray in Jesus' name.